All right, good evening. Finally, get, every, get everybody's attention here. We're going to get started. want to welcome everybody to the Heartland Institute and to the Andrew Breitbart Freedom Center. Heartland was founded in 1984 with the mission to discover, develop, and promote free market solutions to social and economic problems. Now, many of your faces I've seen plenty of times here before, so you know a lot about us. But I kind of want to give everybody a reminder here of, of things around here. To the left and actually behind me is the Michael Perry Maser Library. We have over 18,000 volumes now, or is it more than that now, Joe? Oh, it's over 20 now. <laughs> our librarian's in the back if you have questions about the library. But our library is actually open to the public during the daytime when we're here. We don't check out books and stuff, but you can come in and actually read some of the books and check out some of the books here to look at and read while we're here at work if you're interested. And we're always looking for more donations and stuff as well. We're eventually going to run out of space where we can't work, but we'll have plenty of books here to read. So <laughs> but as one thing we do with our books is we end up, if we have too many, this bookshelf right over here to the left, every book in there is a dollar. So if you find a book in there you'd like to read, it only costs you a dollar, you can pick, it, pick one up tonight. Back here with the food, when you walk through the food, you saw a couple of things in there. There's a table back there full of literature and other books. Everything on that table is free. So you're welcome to pick up copies of all of our literature samples and pass them out to your friends and family and everybody else. Mark Weiermuller has got a, one of the little bumper st stickers right here. Um, but feel free to pick that stuff up. And you'll notice on one corner there's newspapers. That's one of the things we do a lot here that's kind of unique about the Heartland Institute. We have environment and climate news, budget and tax news, and healthcare news. We do have school reform news, but it's on a hi hiatus right now for a few months. But those papers go out to every legislator in the country every month. So once a week they're getting a different paper, paper from us talking about free market policies and how they can use it. And we've surveyed them every two years about how they're using it, how they're reading it. And we found it's between 50 and 65 percent, depending on the paper, read it. And it goes across party lines. And about a third generally actually use information in our paper to inform their decisions on policy. So it's very, very helpful there. And that's why I know some of you have a little boxes on your desk for uh, tables here for donations. And we have a tip jar over there as well. If you like what the work we do, please feel free to join us, become a member, and help sustain our work here. Got a couple other quick announcements here on your table. You'll see a flyer for our benefit dinner. Judge Andrew, Andrew Napolitano is coming Friday night, October 26th, to the Cotillion to speak. So you can. Get a ticket, come and join us there. We also have a couple of other flyers on there coming up after the election, so you don't have to worry about the election. We're going to talk, Twyla Base is coming to talk about medical health care records. These flyers are right on your desk. If you table, please register tonight so you don't forget. But she's going to talk about privacy concerns with your health care records as they all go digital. The following week, November 14th, we have a movie called The Creepy Line. Most of you don't know what that is yet, but you're going to find out. Most of you are on Facebook and Google, and you've heard the stories of how they have a bias against conservatives. Well, they've done a documentary on how Google and Facebook use the social media and platforms to actually s manipulate people and f only give them the news they want, and how they use that, those techniques to manipulate people. So the director of the film, I believe, is supposed to be here that night. Um, so you'll be able to come and ask him questions as well as watch a free movie that, after, that evening. So November Wednesday, November 14th. And I did forget to mention in the room back there are t-shirts. Our t-shirts are on sale for, uh, for $10 each. So look through the t-shirts. We have all different, George Washington, Andrew Breitbart, Milton Friedman, um, Hayek, um, Ayn Rand. So lots of different t-shirts in there you can look at for 10 bucks each. So I want to get a little started tonight. Back after the Parkland shooting, Heartland Institute came up with a concept called child safety accounts. And right as we were doing the same thing, Heritage Foundation was doing, the th was doing something sim similar where they were called student, student safety scholarships. On your table, you're going to see the policy brief by Heritage, the policy brief that we did here at Heartland on child safety accounts and a little booklet on school safety from Heritage Foundation. 
So we kind of partnered with them. We did an event in Washington, D.C. on the same topic, and then we were trying to plan one for here and decided tonight was a great night to do a joint event on um, that. Heart, unfortunately, Heritage Foundation was not able to send a representative tonight. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, but you've got samples of what they're talking about, what we're talking about, and how child safety is something we need to really, really focus on. And for some reason, the slide is not changing here. That's on, okay, took a little bit longer. So a survey was done actually in July about school safety and what parents thought. 34% of parents said they didn't think their schools were safe. In the low income areas, the number was even more dramatic. It was 48% of low income parents didn't think their school was safe. And we've seen a lot of issues around with urban schools and what's going on there. So, I want to show you a little bit about violent statistics, what's going on. Almost 80% of our schools have some type of violent incidents it's in 2015, 2016. This, is, this pretty much tracks almost every single year. 21% of students have reported being bullied during that 2015, 2016 school year with more than a million serious offenses. There's actually 160,000 students skip school each day for fear of being bullied. So the numbers are really dramatic on what's going on in our schools. In 2018, there. WalletHub just did this survey in September. They put out their results of this. In 2018, they showed a statistic every seven minutes a student is being bullied. It's, that's something that should not be happening anywhere. In Illinois, the ranking for Illinois, Illinois is number 19 in bullying prevalence, it's number 15 in bullying impact and treatment, and number four in the high cost of truancy doing, due to bullying. So the, the schools are not dealing with the bullying problem, they're letting it continue, and nothing's happening. This earlier this spring, Chicago Tribune did a story called Betrayed. And this is just some highlights of what happened in Chicago public schools. A track coach raped a student 40 times. There were 430 reports of sexual abuse, assault, and harassment since 2011. And mind you, this is teacher or employee on student. This is not student on student bullying. This are employees of CPS doing this. One teacher had sex with a student for over five years and the parents were never notified. That story about that one teacher is the reason the Betrayed series got written. He, after he graduated, posted on his social media about, the about what had happened to him. The Trib picked it up and started doing FOIA requests into the schools to figure out what was going on. And they uncovered all of this stuff based on this one kid posting on social media about his story that nobody even knew about. A janitor assaulted a six-year-old special education student and an elementary cafeteria worker who had already been convicted of assault was hired and committed more sexual assaults on students. A lot of CPS, they don't, did, never before this, didn't even do background checks of a lot of their employees. They've changed a lot of their practices now. We'll see where it goes, but it's just over and rampant there. And this is just some of the, some of the few incidents that have happened. So real quick, I want to give you a little bit of overview here. 21% of students are bullied, as we saw earlier. 7% of high school students have committed suicide. And then 14% of high school students have considered suicide. All those statistics are per year. The last statistic up there, uh, John will talk a lot more about shootings and stuff like that, but I'm just going to, one statistic here I have here, 0.43% of students are affected by school shootings, and that's since 1999. So that's over a 20-year period where students have been affected by, directly by a school shooting. And the media likes to hype those incidents because it is very dramatic, it is very impactful, 
but they're forgetting to talk about all the suicides and all the kids dying from being bullied and committing suicide long before the school shootings and stuff ever take place. So uh, that statistic, by the way, comes from the Washington Post, which is not known to being very Second Amendment friendly. So this led the Heartland Institute after Parkland to come up with child safety accounts. The child safety accounts is modeled on an education savings account where the money that's already to, uh, earmarked for a child's education would go into account that the parent would then direct for the education of their child. They can pick another school, they can pick a private school, public school, they can homeschool, they can do virtual school, they can do a mix because the ESA allows the flexibility for them to be able to get the education environment that best meets the needs of that child. So they can go, you know, it helps with transportation, helps with travel. One thing you see a lot of though is still students can't pay, some low income area students still don't have the money to pay for some of the better schools. So we added on additional features to the CSA, which is called topping off in, for the most nomenclature, if you ever hear this. What it is, is allows businesses and individuals to donate to a scholarship granting organization that would then help provide that money, more money for the student than the ESA would actually cover so they can get into better schools and do different things that then, then they would have been able to to start with. Also individual ed education tax credits. Illinois has both of these right now, but they're not on top for built for topping off. Their major is for going to other schools. And the education tax credit individual one is used by homeschoolers in the state a lot. And right now, Illinois has actually the highest usage of the individual education tax credit at a little over 300,000 people use that every single year. So even in Illinois, parents are looking for choices. One of the questions, first thing is going to be asked is, are, is school choice, does school choice help with safety? There have been four studies on safety right now. Two were in Washington, D.C., and actually another one was partially Washington, D.C., but every one of these studies showed a positive impact on safety and what parents thought. And you can see the numbers. The Washington, D.C. study in 2018, a 35% increase in parents felt feeling their student was now very safe. 53% in the Wolf study in 2013, and then the other studies 20, 2006, and then 2008 was 51% and 48%. 48% was just up the road in Milwaukee. So getting students out of their environment that's unsafe allows them to get into a safer school. And one statistics you'll always want to keep in mind with this of what word parents think, 53% of parents the paramount issue when they're choosing another school is safety. So now I would like to go ahead and introduce our main speaker tonight, John Lott. He is the president of the Crime Prevention Research Center, and he's an economist who's held research and teaching positions at the University of Chicago, Yale University, Stanford, UCLA, Wharton, and Rice, and he's the chief economist was the chief economist of the United States Sentencing Commission during 1988 and 89. He's published over 100 articles in academic journals and has nine different books tonight. The War on, the, on Guns is in the back. You're, please pick up a copy, buy a copy, get John to autograph it later on tonight. And we'll turn everything over to welcome John Lott to the stage. Okay, well, we'll find out soon. Uh, anyway, I appreciate uh, being invited back here again. I guess it's about two and a half years or something since I was here last time. So um, I thought I would talk a little bit about uh, some of the claims that we frequently hear in the media about uh, guns and crime. And uh, uh, I think I'll skip the beginning part here. So. Um, what I've done is uh, I've taken uh, some pictures from uh, the New York Times and from an article in Vox. Uh, this article in Vox uh, has, was, I had talked to the author, I guess, in like March, 
and he claimed that they had gotten about 20 million hits on it. It had been used extensively before the uh, march on Washington after the Parkland shooting. And uh, <clears throat> so I'll just go through some of these claims that are here, things I think you've often heard. So one of the claims is that the United States is unique in terms of homicides. And this one shows uh, 14 different countries. Uh, the United States has about 30 per, uh, per million people. Switzerland, they have a second, it's 7.7. .7. You know, the thing is, how do you pick 14 countries? Now, uh, one of the claims is, well, they'll look at developed countries, but if you take something like the, uh, uh, you know, OECD, which is kind of the club for developed countries, they have 36 members. So even this is just a portion of, uh, of the countries that they could pick. Here's something from the New York Times. They have even fewer countries here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven countries. Again, the question is, how do you pick the countries that are there? So I just show you, these are homicide rates for all the countries in the world that we have data. Not all countries uh, report homicide data. Uh, the United States is this red line right here. Uh, the average is over here. And the green, the median, means that half, uh, thanks. Th half the countries have higher values and half have lower values. Now, I'm sure for people around Chicago, you're not going to be too shocked by this, but a lot of countries don't honestly report homicide data. Uh, you know, Chicago, I guess you probably know better than I do, but uh, I lived here for a while. Uh, they replaced the medical examiner a few years ago because apparently she wasn't playing ball enough in terms of how to classify things. Uh, there was an excellent article a while ago in Chicago Magazine, and I'm sure you can look at things like Second City Cop, the website, uh, or other things that give you an idea of how they'll classify things as either unclassified, so as not to classify them as murder, or to classify them as an accident or something uh, to try to lower. And of course, it's, the problem's even worse for other types of crimes. But the point is, it's just not unique for Chicago. Lots of these worst countries here are probably a lot worse than we actually see. I'll, I'll give you one example. Uh, the country that's in the news a fair amount is Venezuela. Um, it looks like uh, the homicide rate there may be about 30% or so higher than what they actually report. You can read newspaper accounts where they'll go and they'll say uh, uh, relatives of a, somebody who's been murdered w are threatened that they won't get the body released to them if they go and talk to the media about the fact that uh, a loved one had been killed. Anyway, there are lots of countries where you have that type of problem. Um, now, one other thing I'll just mention, uh, most people seem to think that homicides and murders are the same, and they're not. Uh, the big difference between homicides and murders are what we call justifiable homicides. And the United States has a relatively high rate of justifiable homicides. Is there an echo? Uh, compared to most countries. Uh, thing is, uh, most countries don't report murders. They just report homicides. But if you were to adjust that, the United States would probably be, have about 20% lower rate than's actually shown here. We'd probably be, be down uh, there someplace. Now I'll show you, this is the same type of graph, only this shows firearm homicide rates across countries rather than uh, total homicides. And if you look at this, the United States is in green. Boy, we look a lot worse all of a sudden. Uh, the average is in red, and the median uh, is down over here in kind of purple. So half the countries are above this. The United States looks much, much worse. Is it just that we have a gun problem here in the United States? And the answer is no. You may notice uh, these lines look more spread out than they did before. And the reason is, is about... 45% of the countries don't report firearm homicides. They just report total homicides. And the countries that tend to only report uh, uh,
total homicides and not firearm homicides are just happen to be the ones that have tend to have relatively high homicide rates. Well, you know, if you look at the earlier graph that we had and you just removed a lot of the worst countries, of course that would make the United States look relatively higher compared to others. I mean, if we just took the extreme and got rid of all the countries that were above, then you could make the United States look the worst. And it's just an artifact that 45% of the countries don't even report firearm homicides. So here are the homicide rates for developed countries. You can see the United States is relatively high, but uh, if you look at countries that meet the OECD definition of, uh, of uh, developed countries, you have Brazil and Russia, for example, Chile, uh, that have relatively high rates. Now, there's another type of claim that's out there, and that is uh, that the United States is relatively unique in terms of gun ownership, and they have the same small sets of countries. These numbers are from uh, something called the Small Arms Survey. It's a group that George Soros works with a lot. And it kind of, you know, the thing is, if you can control the numbers that get put out, you can control a lot of the debate. So I'll just give you an example. The second country that they have here is Switzerland with uh, supposedly 46 guns per 100 people. First of all, if it was me, if I was putting this together, I'd have the percentage of the population that have guns. It's a big difference between saying 1% of the population has 100 guns, you know, or, you know, everybody has one gun, you know. And, uh, uh, in terms of how you would imagine would impact crime. But what they do here, one of the things, uh, there are lots of problems with this, but one of the things that they do, for example, that affects Switzerland, is they look at gun ownership as opposed to gun possession. Uh, in 2007, when this survey was done, uh, they would go and uh, uh, you know, in Switzerland, if you're between the ages of 18 and 36 and you're an able-bodied male, you'd be mandated to have a machine gun and in many cases a handgun in your home. Well, those weren't counted in these because the government technically owned the gun, not the individuals. And the, the issue that you have here is, is it gun possession that's bad or who happens to own the gun? Another country that has a big impact in this, I guess it's not listed here, is, uh, is Israel, which um, uh, they supposedly only have about seven guns per hundred people. Uh, technically, the government owns most of the guns in Israel. Uh, you may have possession of a gun for 40 or 50 years, but that's not going to be counted in these numbers because the government owns the gun and not the individual. Um, and there are lots of pro other problems with these types of numbers. For example, uh, they'll rely on registration. Uh, Canada, for example, uh, before they started the long gun registration, uh, if you look at surveys, about 8 million Canadians would, be, would tell pollsters that they owned a long gun. After the long gun registration started there, uh, you would only have about uh, 3 million Canadians that would say they'd own guns, and that's about the same number that registered guns. Now, it could be within a five-year period of time you had a huge drop in gun ownership. Maybe people destroyed their guns or sold them. There was no, uh, no newspaper articles about people selling guns to gun dealers and then having them be destroyed. Uh, and so, you know, it's kind of probably the most obvious thing there is that when you had the registration or running up to it, people were more reticent to go and tell somebody calling them up on the phone whether they owned a gun or not. And they may still have those guns, it's just that they didn't register them. And you see the same thing here. One claim you may often hear is that the United States makes about 4.4 or about 4.6 percent of the world population, but 42 percent of the guns. And uh, you know, you have lots of countries where you have real problems in terms of gun ownership. I'll give you one uh, kind of uh, interesting case back from the 1980s. The former 
UN did large surveys on a lot of countries back in the mid 80s. And one of the countries that they did a survey for was the USSR. And, um, you know, people legally didn't own guns. And the UN surveyed about 5,000 people and couldn't find anybody who admitted to the pollster who was calling up that they were committing a felony and had a gun. I can't imagine why somebody in the Soviet Union might have been reticent to tell some stranger who called them up that they were committing a felony. But if you want to do something fun, interesting, go back and look at news stories from 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. And they were having all these civil wars being fought in Georgia and Tarzikistan and what have you. And you'll find these news articles about these fights being carried out with weapons that people have been storing in their homes from World War II or even World War I. Somehow, I guess, when the UN did its survey, everybody forgot that they had uh, the guns there in the home. Anyway, it's not a very useful number there, even though it gets cited in the press all the time. So what happens is, is that these two types of numbers that we've just been going through get put together. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen these types of graphs, or it's likely that you have on one axis, they'll have guns per 100 people from the small arms survey. And the other uh, axis will be gun deaths per 100,000 people. So this includes suicides and, uh, and homicides. And the United States is way up here all by itself. You know, we're all by ourselves in terms of gun ownership. If you were to fix Switzerland and Israel, they would probably have gun possession rates higher than what we have here in the United States, but uh, uh, I've already gone through the problem. So I'm going to go through and just kind of show you how sensitive these results are to a couple things. Um, so this is just taking uh, all the developed countries except for uh, the three worst ones, Russia and Brazil, and, uh, oh, by the way, I don't know if you saw this, but the guy who won the, uh, the first round in the presidential election in Brazil, I, yeah. Anyway, uh, right now, legal gun ownership in Brazil is like 2% of the population. But uh, he, they have, as I showed you a little while ago, a really high homicide rate. And so... Uh, he wants to make it so that people can legally carry and own guns for self-defense, particularly for women there. They have a, an unbelievable rape rate in, uh, in Brazil. Anyway, so I'm excluding those countries for right now uh, because they're so uh, extreme. And uh, just showing if we were to look across all these countries, you'll get a positive relationship between the uh, small arms survey measure of gun ownership and homicides, just like you just saw from the Vox thing. Now what happens if you just were to ask the question, we look at developed countries except for the United States and ask what can the United States learn from looking at other developed countries? And if you do that, not worrying about any of the problems that we've already talked about with these numbers, you find a slight negative relationship uh, between firearms and uh, homicide rates. Just having the United States in there by itself uh, pulls up that line. I don't know if anybody just geek speak for a second. Uh, you know, you see you have a regression line here. And that just minimizes the sum of the squared errors. So something that's kind of off really pulls things off with outliers a lot because you're squaring the error there. So it's given a huge amount of weight. So just that one observation causes it from being positive to slightly negative. Well, there are other changes we could do. We could put it in the United States if we also include Russia and Brazil and Mexico, other members of the OECD. And you can see you still get this negative relationship there. And uh, you could look at uh, all the countries that are in the small arms survey that we have data for. Uh, and if you do that, you also get a negative relationship. Those that have uh, more guns per 100 people 
are associated with lower homicide rates than you would have had otherwise. Now, I just have to tell you something for a second. I'm showing you what we call cross-sectional data, looking across different places at one point in time. I don't like doing this. I don't think it's very useful. Uh, you know, uh, people often use Chicago in that way. They say, look, Chicago has relatively strict gun control laws, they'll say. Don't even have a gun store in the city. And, uh, um, and it has a relatively high homicide rate. And, uh, and, you know, and we see on the other side, people will go and pick the UK, for example. They'll say, look, the UK has extremely strict gun control. Uh, you can't own a handgun. Uh, rifles are restricted. Uh, so are shotguns. And they have a low homicide rate. So the claim is the UK must have a low homicide rate because it has strict gun control laws. The problem with that that I would point out is that before they had their strict gun control laws, they had an even lower homicide rate. Uh, when they banned handguns in January 97, for example, in the next eight years, you had a 50% increase in homicide rates in uh, the UK. Now, I think that largely due to different types of drug gangs and other things going on there. But the point is, I would argue that they have a low homicide rate despite strict gun control laws rather than because of them. And uh, what you need to do to test things is to look before and after a law changes and how you see changes in crime rates after that law changes relative to other places that aren't changing it. You know, we see this all the time in terms of discussions. About a decade ago, the New York Times had uh, a long series on the death penalty where they said, look, uh, the states with the death penalty have a higher murder rate than states without the death penalty. So they took that as evidence that the death penalty, if anything, had no effect or maybe even caused higher murder rates. The problem that you have is that the states that adopted the death penalty were the ones that had high homicide rates or high murder rates to begin with. That they actually caused them to fall, they actually fell after they adopted it, but it was still higher than the low, hom low murder rate states that didn't adopt the death penalty. So if you merely looked across places, rather than following places over time, you would get this misimpression there. And the same thing is true with the, uh, with, uh, the cross-sectional data for homicide rates across countries. I'm showing you this, and, and it has a negative relationship, but I don't put a lot of weight on it, simply because you're not really accurately controlling for all the differences across places. Uh, and this is, um, uh, this is the firearm homicide rate looking across all countries. Again, whether you look at the total homicide rate or you're looking at the firearm homicide rate, you still get a negative relationship. Now, again, I don't put a lot of weight on these. I'm just going through this because this is often what you see in the newspapers. Now, one thing that the New York Times has reprinted twice within the last 10 months or so is this graph. And it's dealing with mass public shootings. And it says that's using this measure of gun ownership that we've been going through and uh, mass shootings per 100 million people. And again, the United States is way out here. And so the claim is, is that countries that have higher um, gun ownership rates have higher rates of mass public shootings. I mean, it's probably one of the most common comments in uh, the gun control debate. It's something I come across all the time. Um, and, you know, when uh, Obama was president, I can give you dozens of quotes where he'll make these types of statements. He'll say, I say this every time uh, we've got one of these mass shootings. This just doesn't happen in other countries. Uh, the one thing we do know is that we have a pattern of mass shootings in this country that has no parallel anywhere else in the world. And I could, I, as I say, I could go on. Uh, and it's, people look at this and they kind of see these types of graphs that you see in the New York Times, and it has a real impact on people because they say, well, we shouldn't be up here all by ourselves. 
uh, and it must be because we own so many guns, so we need to go and get rid of gun ownership. Now, <clears throat> when uh, the White House, during the Obama administration, was asked about what evidence do they have for this claim, they pointed to a study by a criminologist named Adam Lankford, uh, who looked at what he claimed was a complete list of all the mass public shootings in the world from 1966 to 2012. He claimed to be using the FBI definition of mass public shootings. And uh, the claim was that 31% uh, of all the mass public shootings, shooters in the world over that 47 years were in the United States. Uh, this study, I can't find another academic study that's gotten as much worldwide attention as the Lankford uh, study got. We have one uh, woman who works for the Crime Prevention Research Center uh, who's from China, and she tells me that when she was in China, she heard a lot about the study. I mean, this is the type of thing that uh, foreign countries that don't like the United States too much wanted you know, this was like perfect news for them to go and say what a bad country the United States is. And it just got massive news coverage around the world. Got hundreds of news stories in the United States. Anyway, Langford, when his, i just give you a little bit on this. Uh, when uh, his study first started getting news attention back in 2015, uh, I got a call from a couple of news media outlets, uh, hardly that many. And uh, like the Washington Post called me up and asked me what I thought about his study. And I said, well, I've asked him for it, but he hasn't given it to me. Uh, can you show it to me? And the, and, uh, the woman there said, no, uh, she had been told not to go and give it out to other researchers. And uh, she could only, you know, only the media could see it. And I said, well, you know, maybe that should be a warning sign for you. Um, <laughs> And uh, I said it's a little bit hard to go and comment on. This is something that's gained massive news attention. And I said, well, do you have a list of his cases? And she said, no, she hasn't seen it. And so um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, I expressed some skepticism. I said, look, I don't even know how to find cases in Africa in the 1960s where four people have been shot to death. Uh, or in Central America or other places. I mean, you have places around the world, as I showed you earlier, where you may have homicide rates that are 20-fold higher than the United States. Uh, and, uh, and we get spoiled by data in the United States. I mean, you go and look at the FBI crime report data, and you'll find uh, not only murders and homicides, but you'll find uh, serial murder data, you'll find mass uh, shooting data where four or more people are killed uh, in, in one place, uh, not involving some other type of crime. You'll find it broken down by age of the victim, gender, all sorts of things. Most countries, almost all countries, don't report it as detailed as what we have here in the United States. And uh, <clears throat> um, anyway, you got to go and do news searches to go and find this data for most other countries. And again, we're kind of spoiled in the United States. We know all the mass shooting cases in the United States. People have collected it. It's easy to go and look through computerized databases of, uh, of news stories. We have any lawyers in here? OK, a couple lawyers. Well, you know, you, know, you have Nexus and Westlaw. These are computerized databases of uh, uh, of news stories that you can go and easily search through. Well, a lot of the world doesn't have that, anything even remotely similar to it. Uh, just to give you some idea, some of the media comments, I released my data that I'm going to show you in a minute, uh, and uh, when they did news stories on it, uh, they called up Langford. Uh, and this is just the examples. Uh, Real Clear Politics, uh, Carl Cannon. Uh, uh, he wrote in his story, in phone calls and emails from Real Clear Politics, Langford was asked how he supplemented the NYPD uh, report that he says he relied on uh, and had pretty much all the cases over recent decades. 
He did not answer those queries. No one has responded to requests for his raw data, which is missing from his published paper, or to clear up basic questions. Uh, the Washington Post had something in September. Unlike Langford, Lott has released all his data in nearly 500 pages of appendices so people can reach their own conclusions. Uh, Langford declined a request to release his research or to discuss in any way his findings and comparisons to the Lott report. You know, here's Gary Kleck, some of you may know, in a quote that he gave to Fox a, a few years ago, a couple of years ago. No qualified scholar would accept work by a researcher who would not or, or, or could not or would not even explain exactly how he measured his most important variable mass shootings. So anyway, Langford claims that over this 47 years, there were 202 mass public shooters. He's not, he doesn't tell you the number of shootings. My guess is you're probably talking about something less than 100 uh, outside the United States, which I think would, people would say only, there have been fewer than 100 mass public shootings outside the United States that that would not pass the smell test. I don't know, maybe. But in any case, uh, using his definition, and this is a very conservative estimate here, uh, we got over 3,081 shooters over just the last 15 years of the period. I only looked at the last 15 years of the 47 years that uh, Langford looked at because, as I said, I don't know how to find a lot of these cases in parts of the world. I don't even believe that I've gotten all the cases even over the 15 years. I'll just give you one example. I had done uh, news searches over the Pacific Island nations, and uh, I hadn't found anything for virtually all the countries there. And um, I accidentally came across a police report for just five years from the Solomon Islands, uh, island chain that has about 470,000 people in it. And in this 152-page report, I found one paragraph in there where they mentioned that they had had three large mass public shootings. I mean, you have to realize, here you have a country that has um, about 164th the population that the United States had. If we had the same rate of mass public shootings, four more people in a public place, not part of some gang activity or other type of crime, we would have had over those five years, 1,800 mass public shootings. Obviously, we didn't have anything even remotely, you know, close to that over that period of time. Um, so I think, wow. And by the way, uh, the Solomon Islands had basically banned guns. Uh, didn't seem to stop them from having these attacks. But um, uh, I contacted the national police there saying, well, you know, maybe if uh, they could give me the numbers for the other 15 years I'm looking at, other 10 years of the 15 years I'm looking at, you know, maybe they'd have other cases. They wouldn't really even talk to me. And uh, I called up uh, the one major newspaper in the country because the newspaper didn't even go online until about 2010. Uh, and they hardly, what one would call, have a search command that allows you to go. I mean, again, we're spoiled by a lot of things in the United States. Um, and the police had already talked to them and basically told them not to talk to me. So uh, finally, after bugging everybody for a long time there, I, it kind of became clear to me that here's this little island nation, set of islands. Where do you think they get most of their money from? tourism. So you have some nutty researcher in the United States asking you about all these mass public shootings that you might be having. You know, there's, I can, it's kind of understandable why they may not want to go and talk to you a lot about it. Anyway, we ended up spending about $50,000 on doing this report. And uh, again, I don't think we have all of them, but so these are kind of conservative estimates, very conservative estimates, I think. But the United States, we make up about 4.6% of the world population over these 15 years. We make up about 1.4% of the mass public shooters, about 2.1% of the murders, and about 2.9% of the attacks. So we're well below the world average 
in terms of uh, either uh, uh, you know shooters or murders or uh, or uh, attacks. The United States ranks 62nd in terms of murder rate uh, from mass public shootings. You have countries like Norway, Finland, Switzerland, and Russia are major European countries with at least 45 percent higher rates of murder from mass public shootings than the United States has. All right, so uh, this is with our data kind of corrected here. Uh, so rather than the United States being way up here all by itself, and this is still using this kind of uh, wacky uh, measure of gun ownership here. I should have mentioned one thing earlier. I forgot about it. So um, if you took this graph here, and I mentioned that if the, you had fixed Switzerland and uh, Israel, just those two countries, those two countries by themselves would pull this line back down so it's negative. So even if you have the United States, even if you exclude uh, you know, Russia and Brazil, uh, just putting those, fixing just those two countries, not fixing any of the other ones that are also problematic, you would pull it down. Anyway, but I'm using the small arms survey data. There we go. But you can see you actually get something of a negative relationship here uh, if you fix this, even using the crazy measures that uh, exist there of gun ownership across countries. And this, but you know, this type of gra graph, you know, that you've seen, they've actually published this twice in the New York Times, as I say, over like the last nine months or so. Uh, the Langford stuff regularly still gets reported. I, uh, I sent emails to about 200 US-based reporters who had reported on the Langford study to begin with. I got three emails back, and um, uh, the two of them basically just said thanks. Uh, and one said that he no longer works for the publication. So uh, he couldn't do anything. He sounded like he may have been willing to do it if they had done it. But, you know, it just amazing me. Here you have a guy who refuses to let anybody look at his list of cases uh, there and won't talk to the press about it. He, he, this has gotten massive world attention. As I say, it has had a huge impact on the gun control debate. All right, uh, here's another claim that people frequently hear uh, if you read the New York Times or other major papers, uh, and that the gun ownership rate in the United States, only 32% of households in the United States have a gun, and that this has fallen dramatically over the last 50 years or so. Uh, you go back to the early 1970s, the claim is about 50% of households owned a gun, now it's down to 32%. This is from something here, the General Social Survey. It's out of Newark at the University of Chicago. Uh, Tim Smith, or Tom Smith, is actually somebody that I knew there. Uh, and I'll just, I actually have a quote from him in my book, uh, The Bias Against Guns, where I had talked to him about the survey. And he was very proud of the fact that they were showing that gun ownership was falling because he had told me that it would, um, help politicians do the right thing if they didn't believe that that many people own guns. I'll just um, give you a story uh, here. Um, uh, I guess this is about four years ago or so. I got a call from a producer at ABC News. They were doing a special about guns in the home and the risks of guns in the home. And uh, I don't know, I talked to her for an hour and a half or so. and. Towards the end of our discussion, she made the comment, she says, well, maybe it really doesn't matter that much that, uh, uh, you know, we have these problems from guns because gun ownership is falling a lot over time. And, uh, you know, it, hopefully it won't be that much of a problem. And I said, well, uh, what are you doing relying on the general social survey? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, you know, ABC News has its own survey and ABC, Washington Post, and you guys don't find that gun ownership is falling. You actually show it's been fairly constant over time. He said, oh, no, no, no. 
you know, it's been falling, it's been falling dramatically. I've seen the survey and I said, well, you know, you guys have your own survey. And, uh, and she didn't believe me, so I sent her a link to her survey. And uh, anyway, when they end up running the news stories, wh whose survey do you think they use? They use the New York Times rather than their own survey on it. And, uh, uh, you know, I think one of the reasons why this survey, GSS survey, gets used so much is that they want to make gun owners feel isolated or different that somehow gun ownership is falling. Uh, I just mentioned one thing. Um, this GSS survey uh, has shown that there's been a substantial decline over the last decade or so, last 15 years, of gun ownership in Illinois. Now, uh, you could look at surveys, but I looked at FOID card data and I only was able to get it over like 10 years. But uh, there's like a 10 year period of time, I can't remember, it goes from like 2005 to 2015. It doubled over that period of time. So either a lot of people are getting FOID cards just to show off to their friends, <laughs> and, uh, or um, they, uh, you know, there's something there about this survey not picking up uh, the increase in gun ownership in Illinois and actually uh, showing a drop. Anyway, <clears throat> um, I'll show you. So here's the uh, data from the ABC News Washington Post poll. This looks pretty flat to me. Uh, this shows about 45%, 46% at the beginning and about 43% at the end of the period. Surely nothing like the drop that you saw there. Uh, and I'll show you something else. Um, uh, these are the most recent surveys for different surveys. So NBC News, uh, Wall Street Journal had a survey that came out in March. Now I have to tell you another thing. A lot of these surveys on whether people support gun control or not, or whether you own a gun, they're not like they're done every March or something. They are done when there's news about guns. And that tends to be during things like right after a mass shooting. And so you kind of wonder what impact asking people, you know, you, first of all, you ask them a bunch of questions about what they think of mass shootings and what have you, and then you ask them whether they own a gun. Maybe people might be reticent to go and say they own a gun. I don't know. But um, anyway, uh, so here we have uh, ABC News, Washington Post, GSS, Quinnipiac, CNN, Pew Research, Gallup, CBS News, Monmouth this, earlier this year in March, and the NBC News Wall Street Journal. Uh, you can see the one that's the outlier is the GSS survey. Now I have three lines here. I have the blue line uh, is uh, people, the households that say they have a gun. Uh, the burnt orange are people who basically refuse to answer. And then the green line here is apportioning the burnt orange based on uh, the answers of the percentage of households that say they own a gun. And uh, you can see here this is 32 or 33 percent. But uh, the average for everybody without the GSS is 43 and 45. These surveys from this year show it's 46% or 49, 48%. Now, there's good reasons to believe that all these surveys underestimate this for a number of reasons, the gun ownership rate. One reason that you can look at, for example, is there's a big gap between married men and married women uh, who say that they own a gun in the home. Now, you know, there's lots of explanations. Maybe the guy doesn't tell the wife that they own a gun. Um, it, that's one possibility because men, married men are much more likely to say they own a gun in the home than uh, the wives are. Or it could be women may be just more reticent to go and tell somebody who's calling them up and asking him questions whether or not a gun is owned in the home. Um, but if you were to 
assume that married women own guns, say they own guns in the home at the same rate that married men do, uh, you'd have to add about someplace, depending upon the survey here, maybe about 5 to 8% more onto the gun ownership rate. So m almost all these would be close to 50% or over 50%. All right. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go through this really quickly because you've already had a talk on this. Uh, but, you know, the survey data comes in a little bit into this, too, because there's a survey after the Parkland school shooting about uh, whether people wanted to have armed teachers or not. And uh, uh, there's an interesting breakdown here. While overall, Adults were somewhat against it. 48% were against Army teachers. 43% were in favor. It's interesting if you ask people, adults, whether they had with school-aged children or adults without school-aged children. Uh, adults with school-aged children in either elementary or secondary school, they actually strongly support that. 59% supported it. Uh, without adults without kids, they opposed it by 54%. You just have a lot more adults without school-age kids than you have adults with school-age kids, so you end up getting it so that, uh, so, you, so that most adults oppose it, even though the rate that adults with kids support uh, armed teachers is higher than it is for the ones that don't. So the people who have something at stake actually want to have armed teachers. Uh, obviously, Republicans are much more likely to support it, and Democrats, about two-thirds of Democrats, are against it. Uh, Independents, the Rasmussen survey didn't, doesn't show uh, the negative, or I would have shown the blue and the red for each of these. Uh, I'm kind of limited by what they showed, but Independents actually oppose it too. So the thing is, so earlier you were hearing a talk about essentially a voucher system so that people could choose schools based on whether they uh, thought the school did a better job in terms of providing safety for their kids. And there's at least some evidence here that if you allow that type of competition, uh, as opposed to teachers and administrators who tend to be very liberal, you know, Democrats here who oppose it, you'd be more likely to have pressure on the schools to go and have armed teachers. Uh, so I'm not going to go through these things because you kind of already got some of the points. I guess the one thing I would make just as a comment, when they say there's like a million uh, acts of violence at school, um, you have to realize that there's uh, 54 million students that are elementary or secondary school. So you have to, you know, almost a million sounds big, but, and also a lot of those are fairly trivial. The vast majority of those million are relatively trivial acts of violence. Um, and uh, so you have to kind of put it on a per capita rate. All right, what time is it? I don't see a clock around here. I don't want to. I my problem is I can talk forever. So, <laughs> the um, uh, okay. Anyway, uh, uh, so I, I through one or two other kind of myths here that we hear a lot about. Guns allow people to kill themselves much more easily. This is from Vox. Again, this is the thing that about 20 million kids uh, or 20 million. Uh, hits on it, uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of schools use this in the run-up to the March for Our Lives that the schools had. And, and this is their graphic they show. They look at Indiana, uh, firearm, the percentage of firearm, homicide, or firearm suicides that result in the death of the person is about 97%. Poisons, only 7% uh, are successful in cutting. Uh, is only 5.1 percent. You know, it's the poisonings are largely going to include things like people taking overdoses for sleeping pills and what have you. Um, I, I'll just show you. This is uh, cases for Los Angeles County, which has a very detailed breakdown. Um, a shotgun to the head is 99 percent 
likely to result in, in successful suicide. <laughs> Cyanide is 97%. A handgun or a gunshot to the head, usually handguns, is 97%. Explosives, 96. Uh, hit by a train is 96%. Jumping from a height is 93%. One thing you got to realize, um, and a lot of these are less painful than shooting oneself. Uh, trains, uh, they also have this measure of how painful it is because you die so instantly uh, from going in front of a train. Um, uh, it actually is less painful. Uh, uh, but in any case, people, you know, when you're talking about things like uh, sleeping pills, uh, people choose methods based upon partly whether they want to be successful. You know, so a lot of women use sleeping pills, and, uh, but they may take five sleeping pills or six sleeping pills. That's not a healthy thing to go and do, but you're probably not going to die as a result of it. And the normal thing that when you read the literature on these things is that they talk about it as a cry for help. You know, they want to get attention. They want people to come and try to help them deal with the problems. Guys are not into that as much, it seems like, cries for help. Uh, and so they're more likely to pick guns. You know, one of the things I'll just mention is um, uh, often the public health people, they'll m lump together suicides and uh, homicides. And you have relatively high suicides in rural areas, you know, so you have a lot of like uh, the Western Mount, Rocky Mountain state have high suicide rates. And there's actually a pretty simple reason for that. And that is um, uh, it's older people who are committing suicide. And uh, when you have people who are on ranchers or farms or in very rural areas, if the, if the husband dies, the wife leaves the area. If the, if the wife dies, the husband stays there. And you have a huge gender imbalance in those rural areas just in general, but particularly when you're talking about older people like over 60. I mean, you can find areas where it's like 30 percentage points or 25 percentage points. And it uh, seems like you have high suicide rates there simply because of, uh, of this people get very lonely. Now, Australia is one thing that people talk a lot about, and uh, uh, you know, you'll hear these claims that uh, after they did this gun buyback in 1996 and 97, uh, the suicide rate may have, with firearms may have fallen by 63 percent, or the homicides with firearms may have fallen by 50 percent. Here's the problem that you have with it. And that is, if you have a, a number that's falling over the whole period of time, what people do is they just take the before and after average. But you could have picked any point along that period and you're always going to have the after average be below the before average. If I have a line that's, let's say, perfectly straight and I have a law that changes, but it keeps on falling at exactly the same rate before and after that law changes. I look at that and I say, well, you know, the after average is below the before average, and you can claim that it had an impact, but I look at this line and it doesn't deviate at all. There's no downward shift. It doesn't start falling at a faster rate uh, afterwards. It's pretty hard for me to look at something like that and say that there's no that there's been a big impact from the law, and this is just Australian suicides. They were falling for about 15 years prior to the gun back, buyback, and they were falling afterwards, but actually at a slower rate. Here's the regression line for the after period, relative to the regression line that you have in the before period here. So if anything, since it's falling at a slower rate afterwards, you know, you could go and argue that it actually caused it to, uh, uh, to slow down the benefits that you have. And you see a similar type of thing uh, for uh, firearm homicides. And by the way, uh, one of the things that most people don't talk about is that while you had a big sudden drop in terms of gun ownership, and by the way also 
non-firearm suicides went up uh, or stayed flat over this period. Um, uh, you had this big drop, about a third of guns were bought by the government and destroyed. People were able to go and buy guns again after that. By 2010, the gun ownership rate in Australia was back to where it was prior to the buyback. So, uh, you know, you should have seen then a big sudden drop in firearm homicides and then a gradual increase over time, and you don't see that. Uh, I'll just do one more thing. <clears throat> um, this is not so much guns, but it's something that uh, a lot of people point to uh, automobile regulations saying, look how well this has worked for savings lives, and so we should use this as the model for uh, regulating guns. Nicholas Kristof at the New York Times, is uh, this is his graph that he had. Now, just so you know, they show the drop over the whole period here, but you didn't really have federal regulations going to affect till 68. The seatbelts in the cars were companies put them in on their own. Um, now, here's what happens if you look at the whole period of time. We actually have data going back to 1920. And this, these are uh, fatalities per million miles driven in cars. The federal auto safety regulation law was passed in 62. Uh, the first safety act started in 1967. And uh, you can see things were improving really fast without any regulations mandating safety. Uh, companies competed against each other. You know, you didn't want to have glass that shattered when, if you got thrown through the front window. As we just mentioned, they put seatbelts in. When they passed the law, things actually froze. You didn't get any improvement. It actually went up a little bit there. Then it started going down again, but at a slower rate than what was happening before. Well, why did this happen? Does anybody know what happened there? Um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, companies had been developing their own safety you know, studies on their own. But when the federal government got involved, the federal government just doesn't say, go and do airbags. They tell you, go and do airbags, and this is how they're going to be set up, and these are the chemicals that you're going to use, and these are the sensors you're going to use, and this is how you're going to build it into the steering column. Very micro regulations about how it's going to be set up. So you're an automobile company, and let's say you're going to go and put airbags in your cars. Well, one of the issues that you have is it costs a lot of money to go and, and put together the, uh, uh, you know, the machinery that's going to build that and put it into the cars. Well, what happens if a year or two years later the federal government comes back and says, okay, we're glad you've been putting them in, but here's the way we want you to do uh, airbags. And so the companies essentially have to rip up all the investments that they've made and put new investments. I see you. Um, put new investments in, and so it just freezes what they do. They wait now until the federal government goes and tells them how they're going to do it. And so that's the reason why they kind of stopped innovating and actually slowed down the process because they have to wait for the government to do it. Anyway, there are lots of other things I could go through here and talk about, but I'm being told we need to stop. So um, uh, anyway, uh, I'll just mention... Uh, if you want to, we put out research studies all the time. Uh, if you want to, you go to our website at crimeresearch.org, uh, and uh, you, you can, at the bottom, there's a sign-up, or if you look at the page for a while, it'll come up with a little thing that you can subscribe to our email list. And uh, so just go to crimeresearch.org, and you can see the research and stuff that we put out regularly. Now, I understand... I understand that he's going to be deciding who gets to ask questions. So. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll try to switch back and forth on both sides of the room. We are filming, um, who, so we take a little bit of time to make sure the cameras are on you. So there's a couple other rules. Make sure you raise your hand if you want to ask a question, and I'll take time's coming around and making sure everybody gets a question here. If you're online, actually, too, if you want to ask a question, feel, feel free to put down a question. And it's being monitored in the back. 
So we'll get your question from online as well. We're going to start right over here with Charlie. Um, but yeah, feel free to ask questions. We'll welcome all the questions you have. I know John's got a lot more information here that we didn't have time for tonight, but I want to make sure you guys can ask questions as well. Thank, thank you, Dr. Lott. Um, I read an article some time ago, you were probably really up on this, that if you were to take the four major cities in the United States out of the equation in terms of gun, you know, crime rates here, that it would change overall for the United States? Not true? Well, I mean, it would have some impact, but uh, look, uh, as I remember the stupid, this is one of these memes that go around the internet. Uh, they basically said if you take out the four worst cities, Chicago being one of them, I guess, uh, in terms of homicides, it would take the United States from being the highest in the world, at least this is the one I've seen, which I've already told you is not true. We're below the mean and the median already. And it would make us one of the lowest. So, you know, you can go and look up the numbers yourself. I mean, you go and uh, cut out. Let me put it to you this way. Um, uh, if you cut out the 2% worst uh, counties in the United States, so these are bigger than cities, uh, they account for about 50% of the murders. Uh, but that's, we have 3,140 counties. So that's about 60 counties. You count out the 60 worst counties, you can get to half of it. But you count out the four worst cities, or even the 10 worst cities, four worst, I think it's like less than 10%. I think it's like maybe 8% or something. I mean, some effect, but you're only going to change it just a couple slots there. It's not going to, we're not the worst <laughs> by any means right now. Well, I just had a quick question. You talk about London and England, and uh, when they banned the guns, that was at the end, well, it was part of a great big uh, increase in crime. We, everybody we know over there has been burglarized, and that was long before they really cracked down the guns. Now everybody's getting stabbed. I mean, is it some kind of idea of the government abandoning the citizens or something? Well, um, the UK has a violent crime rate that's about twice the violent crime rate in the United States, and they've had that for a long time. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I... Obviously, you have some stabbings and stuff like that. I, look, I think what you need to make clear when you're talking about this is guns make it easier to kill people. But guns also make it easier to go and protect people and prevent bad things from happening. And uh, the other thing just to mention, you know, one of the reasons why we have so many murders in a small area in the United States is you have gang violence. I mean, Chicago, people in Chicago know about the drug gang violence that you have here. And... Um, uh, you know, there's drug gang violence in other countries. We have a relatively worse drug gang problem. Americans, I guess, like to use drugs more than a lot of other people in other countries do. And also, we enforce the laws against it more than a lot of other places do uh, that may have a problem. But, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, you got... The UK, uh, one of the reasons why they had the 50% increase in homicides after handguns were banned was because uh, the drug gang violence increased. You know, they still got weapons and other things. You know, one of the things is um, uh, look how much effort the US government spends on trying to keep people from getting illegal drugs. Uh, these, if I, if I could click my fingers right now and cause all illegal drugs to disappear from the United States and all guns, how long do you think it would be before illegal drugs started coming back into the United States? If you're in El Paso, maybe 20 minutes, something like that. <laughs> but the thing is, when they go and they bring in the illegal drugs, they're going to bring in the weapons that they need to protect it. It's not like a drug gang can go to the police and say, look, this other gang stole our drugs. Can you help us get them back? Okay? They essentially have to set up their own military to protect that very valuable property that they have. And if you, if you think that it's somehow a lot more difficult for them to go and bring in weapons to protect that valuable property than it was to bring in the drugs, 
I, I think you're dreaming. Uh, I gave, I testified before the Mexican uh, Senate and the House about a year and a half ago, um, their constitution committees, because there was some discussion for a little while there about relaxing their gun control laws. Mexico has one gun store in the country since 1973. Uh, it's in Mexico City. It's run by the military. Guns are really expensive. It takes forever to go and buy a gun there. Um, and, uh, uh, but yet they have a huge homicide rate. Also, the only guns you can buy, the highest caliber gun that you can buy legally in Mexico since 1973 is 22 caliber. Now, you don't see a lot of gang fights in Mexico using 22 caliber guns. The thing is, just as they're able to go and bring in drugs from the rest of the world to transit into the United States, uh, they bring in weapons. They also steal a lot of weapons from the Mexican military and other places. And so, you know, it's just a perfect example of the fact that uh, they don't even have guns to go and steal from other people. They go and bring them in with the drugs there, and you have the same types of problems. Okay, make sure you get your hands raised for questions. So we'll go over here next. But real, real quick while we're waiting to get to Victor there for a question. Um, John, I don't know if you've done any research on this, but I'd heard from a group in Chicago that talked about the gun violence there with the gangs. Right. And they actually claim that the kingpin laws that would send drug dealers to prison for life uh, for the third offense actually cause some of the things because now there's more turf wars in Chicago. I don't know if you've done any research on that at all or not. Uh, what, because you get rid of the t got important guys in the thing and then there's yeah, competition there's to replace them? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, they can go and get kids. You know, one of the things that you have, these gangs, if you treat... Uh, people under 15 differently than you do adults. Then they go and recruit kids to go and do things. Or uh, uh, if there's no longer, you know, if you don't have a death penalty, of course this doesn't apply to Illinois because you don't have it at all, but if you only have the death penalty for adults and not for 17 year olds, you know, then they may go and do, uh, you know, 17 year olds will do the killings rather than 18 year olds. But, yeah, I mean, I don't, I haven't really heard of that too much. But, I mean, surely if you go and you create chaos, you know, then you're going to have fights over determining who's going to be running things. But I'm not sure why the three strikes type laws would necessarily go and target those people as opposed to other people commit violence. Hi, thank you. Um, so you, the book that I just purchased today, The War on Guns, Arming Yourself Against Gun Control Lies, right? So my question is, if they're lying, if they're intentionally trying to, you know, obfuscate the issue and, and put false facts out there, why are they doing that? What's their end game? Uh, who knows? I mean, I, I don't know. Look, I mean, I've been going through this stuff with you. I'm not going to say the newspaper people understand all this stuff, uh, but uh, the researchers who put a lot of these studies together, I mean, if you read the book, uh, you'll see I, the war on guns. You'll see I go through a lot of public health studies and things like that. I don't know how you can look at these studies and not realize that they understand how they're playing with this to go and get particular results that they have. Um, and... Uh, uh, you know, why? You know, I could guess, but I think it's probably best not to try to figure out why people are doing it. My thing just to do is to say, is this accurate or not? So. Mark. So this is a great presentation. It just shows how uh, misinformation we're getting. In Chicago, there's a site, Hey Jackass, that reports the homicides. There's 457 so far this year right. as of today or last week. So my question, I actually asked you ahead of time for full disclosure, uh, kind of like Hillary Clinton. I planted the question, but I asked uh, John, why well, is I it? I told you not to tell me it. But anyway. <laughs> in, case, in case someone tracks this down later and says, but in Chicago, they're always talking about, uh, and I'm talking about Rahm Emanuel and Commander Eddie Johnson, gun violence. I noticed uh, Lenny just said gun violence and illegal guns. They use these terms. Am I off? Okay. And they never talk about the criminals or uh, things like Commander Bowers, uh, who Commander 
hour and things like this. So I, so I don't. He's basically asking, since so your microphone's going in and out, I'll just say he's asking why do they use terms like gun violence rather than just violence or something? You know, if people die, doesn't we just care about whether they die as opposed to how, why they die or whatever? And, you know, there's some truth to that. I'm sure the reason why they like to emphasize gun violence is because they also partly have an agenda on trying to push gun control, and they want to emphasize it all the time. But look, as I mentioned earlier, guns make it easier for bad things to happen, but they also make it easier for people to protect things, prevent bad things from happening. And the question is, what's the net effect that we're going to have? But I, if my research, anybody who's read More Guns, Less Crime knows, or my other books, knows that I think there are two groups of people who benefit the most from owning guns. It's basically the people who are most likely to be victims of violent crime, and that overwhelmingly tends to be poor blacks who live in high crime urban areas, and, uh, and people who are relatively weaker physically, and that tends to be women and the elderly. And so, um, uh, you know, here in Illinois, uh, I guess it costs Four hundred plus dollars, four fifty to go and get a concealed carry permit. You know, you pay the fees and and get the sixteen hours of training. Uh, you know, you go and look at Chicago. There's no training facilities in the city, so you, and you can't take the gun with you on public transportation. So if you're a poor person, it's kind of like they went through and checked the boxes to make it hard for poor people to get it. Not only do you have the fees that are there, let's say $450 plus, but then uh, you have to go and you, you don't own a car, you have to borrow a car, you're gonna have to do it for at least a couple days to be able to go and travel. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, you have to go well outside the city limits to be able to go and get the training. And it's kind of like they made everything they could difficult to particularly make it so that poor people, the very people that would benefit the most from having it aren't going to be able to go and have guns for protection. All right, real quick, I know Phil's got a question here, but first I have a question from Rafal, who's watching on YouTube. What is a good answer for the common criticism of guns in the home are more likely to cause harm and injury than those used in self-defense? Uh, well, he hasn't read any of my books. <laughs> but uh, I'll just say, look, I mean, uh, here's the bottom line. Um, there's a series of studies that have been done uh, in, by a guy named Arthur Killerman and his co-authors. And what they'll do is they'll look at a city or a set of cities over the course of a year, and they'll go and they'll find people who died in or near residence asked the relatives of the deceased whether they owned a gun, and then they just assumed that if somebody died from a gunshot and a gun was owned in the residence, that it was that gun that was involved in the killings. When people have gone back and looked at this, what they find is that by, even when you're including suicides, about 84% or so, or 86%, I guess, of the deaths were actually due to weapons being brought in from the outside the home rather than the gun that was in the home there that caused the death. Now, um, there's a bigger problem. And if you fix that data error, I guess you could call it a data error, it reverses the claim there. But there's a bigger kind of theoretical problem that's here. And that is, uh, so they, they look at people who died in or near residents ask the relatives of the deceased whether they owned a gun, and then they have a control group of people who are the same age, sex, and race who live within a mile of the deceased, and ask them whether they own a gun. And then they run a regression on it, and they say whether you own a gun is more likely to be associated with whether you die. And the problem is, uh, and when I debated Kellerman, um, I said, well, let's apply your methodology to studying the efficacy of, uh, of hospitals. So what we're gonna do is we'll look at Chicago, let's say over the course of the year, we'll go and find people who died, ask their relatives whether the person had gone to the hospital, and then we'll have a control group of people who are the same age, sex, and race who live within a mile of the deceased, and ask them whether they've been to the hospital. And my guess is if you were to run a regression on that, you'd find that people who went to the hospital were more likely to die 
than people who didn't go to the hospital. Now, I don't know, maybe then we should go out and try to ban hospitals, but presumably most people would realize that there's a problem with that, and that is there's a reason why somebody went to the hospital and the reason why the other guy didn't go to the hospital. The reason guys went to the hospital was because they were sick, okay? And maybe they'd have an even higher chance of dying if they hadn't gone to the hospital. Whereas the people who didn't go to the hospital didn't go there because they were healthy. So the question isn't whether sick people are more likely to die than healthy people, right? What you want to do is find two people who are equally sick, one person who goes to the hospital and the other who doesn't, and find whether there's a difference in death rates there. And I think we'd all pretty much agree what we'd expect to find. The same thing is true with guns. You know, some of these people <coughs> who may have died who own guns may have been gang members. Maybe some people, even though they live within a mile of somebody else, there's something else different about their place that caused their place to be broken into multiple times. So they were at higher risk. And so just like the example I was just talking about with the hospital care, if they didn't own a gun, maybe they would have been even more likely to die. But there are all sorts of problems. Not only do you have this thing about just assuming that if a gun was in the home and somebody died, that it was that gun that was used in the death, you have other types of comparison issues that you have there. Um, so uh, I can't remember what I was going to say, but the but the, those are just some of the problems that you have there. And hey, Rafal, you need to make sure you guys some of John Lott's books and read them. So uh, last question here. Phil will have the last question tonight. Uh, yes. Uh, this has to do with uh, mass shootings, and I want to use Parkland as, uh, as an example. Immediately, almost immediately after the shooting, um, Somebody funded the manufacture of signs, provided buses, uh, pr provided uh, chants, accused certain organizations of being terrorists, and so forth. Um, who do you think was behind all of that activity, and do you have an opinion as to what their end game is? There are lots of people who gave money. I mean, uh, <clears throat> you know, everybody from corporations to Michael Bloomberg to others that did it. You have actors that gave money. Lots of people who thought that they were doing, you know, a good job or helping make society better. Um, I mean, my own belief is that they think that the world would be a lot better if they caused all guns to disappear. Um, my response to them would be, well, you know, we've tried that. Chicago's tried that. Other places have tried that. And I can't find one place that's banned all guns or all handguns and seen the murder rate go down or even stay the same. Every place that's tried banning all guns or banning all handguns has seen murder rates go up and often by very large amounts. Uh, and there's a simple reason for that, and that is when you do something like ban guns, or this applies to regulations generally, uh, it's the most law-abiding good citizens who obey the rules, not the criminals. And to the extent that you primarily disarm law-abiding citizens relative to criminals, I'm not saying you may not, you may have some impact on criminals, but if the major impact is on law-abiding citizens, then you make it relatively easier for criminals to go and commit crimes. Yep, let's everybody give John a round of applause. <laughs> Couple of housekeeping things. Uh, John's going to be here for a little while. If you have some other questions, you can talk to him personally. But go to the back, buy a copy of his book so you can get his autograph tonight and definitely read his book and learn more about everything he's doing and, what, and the war on guns here.